and get started. Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, it's great to see you guys. Not quite as many people here in person. Um, but um, so I'm going to basically kind of go over some housekeeping stuff with you guys. Um, and then Melody Rose is going to come and talk to you all about disease, uh, like organic disease prevention and praise and things that you can look for in East Tennessee. Um, but I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping things. So if you haven't gotten my three, four email, our plant pickup is tomorrow um, from four to six at the office. It's going to act similarly as it was last time. We'll have volunteers at like one to start dividing people if you're going to volunteer to hand out stuff either at 350. Um, and we will be handing out um, plants, seeds, insect netting, and hoops. Um, so I sent out an email last week or the week before about like what those types of things can be used for. Um, so, but if you have questions, I would recommend just kind of like researching um, insect netting and how it can be used and all the things. Um, first year gardeners will get, I believe 20 uh, wire metal hoops um, to be used for the insect netting. And then your protect net, which is the insect netting, it's really good quality stuff. Um, so I think like with good practices, you could get maybe three to five years of use out of it. Um, and then take good care of it and try not to, you know, leave it out for the winter, things like that. Um, but yeah, make sure that you sign up for a time for pickup. Um, that is very important because we will divide orders based off of when you um, sign up for your time so that we can make sure that people that are coming earlier are getting their orders filled earlier. Um, our next food preservation class is gonna be um, May 13th from 6 to 7.30. It'll be here. It'll be cooking. Rachel Dean will be pick, or will be teaching that, and I'll send out an email with the registration info for that. And then I think our other one in May is going to be actually a kids only cooking class. So that's super fun. Um, we really want kids to come out and learn how to cook. So and you know do some fun things in the kitchen. So that'll be really fun. Um, I'm going to do a um, pest and disease control pickup on May. 21st. It's a Tuesday, 4 to 6. Um, we will need volunteers for that, but you will be receiving spinosad, which is an organic pest control spray, serenade, which is an organic disease control spray. Um, Melody Rose, you might talk about these. Um, and then liquid fish fertilizer, which is really great, um, like a fast release fertilizer for your plants to give them an extra boost throughout the growing season. Sluggo, which is a granule um, that can help deter slug from your plants when sprinkled around the plant. Um, and then first years only will also get spray bottles for that. Um, sweet potatoes will be coming in at the end of May. So I will be sending out a order form for those. Um, it's going to be, you're just going to type in how many you want. So it's not going to be, there's not a limit on it, um, but, you know, not 500 sweet potato slips. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it, they come in plant form. So basically, like, if you have a sweet potato and you just, like, leave it for a while, it'll sprout. Um, and they will come in these little slips that are, like, this big. And then you put that in the ground and they grow sweet potatoes. They are... We'll probably hand it out at the next workshop. So I encourage everybody to come in person. Um, if you cannot make it for the workshop or get kids, you can come before the workshop early or after the workshop between like 7.30 and 8 before the center closes um, to pick up those sweet potato slips. Um, and I will make sure to get that out. Um, our next workshop will be June 3rd here. We'll be having Adam Watson from Washington County Extension, um, and he will be discussing organic pest prevention and control. It's always, this is about the time when pests and diseases start cropping up in your garden. So, you know, I wish that we could go over like everything today, but it's such a massive topic. We have to split it into two workshops. 
Um, and so you're going to get to June and you're going to be like, I wish you'd done pests first and in May. But, um, you know, we have that same thing with with diseases. With diseases, it's all about prevention. because So we're really trying to focus on getting that prevention in before those diseases hit your plants. Um, and then your next harvest totals are due June 3rd. So just to have that in your mind, um, I know all of you probably, or most of you don't have harvest totals, that's okay. I still ask that you check in with me via email. Um, I did not get a lot of emails from people checking in and I that's a requirement. Like you have to check in every month for your harvest totals, even if you do not have harvest totals because it's such an important part of funding for our program. We need to know that everyone is like actively participating and making sure that they are recording any harvest totals or not. So please do that. I also will have a report due the first week of June. So I'm gonna need the most accurate harvest totals possible to turn in to our funders. And this is how we continue to get money for this program. So very, very important. Um, a couple things for ARCD coming up is um, we have an exhibit happening right now at the Fishman um, Art Gallery in downtown Johnson City called Ag and Art. Um, and it's a really awesome curated exhibit that a lot of uh, the staff at ARCD have put many, many hours into. Um, and we recommend that you go and see it. It's it's really, really cool. Um, and then we also have posters in the back. Bethany was kind of um, talking about it when you walked in. Um, but they're $30 each and they go to support the work that we're doing. They're also really cool posters. They were designed by a local artist. And so if you are interested in buying one of those, we can take cash or check tonight or um, you can bring it to purchase tomorrow. Um, at the at the material distribution. Summer field school is happening May through August. I sent out an email about that. If you're still interested, I think there are still tickets available. Um, I can send that in the follow-up, but we're basically visiting local farms in the area and it's a really cool way to just kind of learn about local agriculture. Last but not least, we have um, Appalachian Fusion. So this is our annual farm to table dinner farm fundraiser. Um, for the organization I work for, ARCD, and um, we are looking for volunteers for this. It'll be September 21st, the Saturday. Um, generally, every year we need volunteers to help with like food prep in the kitchen, which is actually super fun. <laughs> um, and then like parking attendants or people to check in, things to people to like run the auction, things like that. So um, if you want to volunteer, that would be really awesome. I will send out a volunteer interest form in our follow up. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, I am like allergy-ish right now, so my voice is kind of going. Um, Come on now. I swear we're going to talk about diseases here in just a minute. Maybe. I'm not advancing. Here we go. This thing's not going to work. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to manually roll with it. So, um, like Rosie said, my name's Melody Rose. I do work in Green County. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, and I'm going to say this because I know the program is funded through Berea College. I am a Berea College graduate many moons ago. So, my undergrad was actually more crop science and agronomy. So, my background is actually tobacco, but don't let that scare you because this is where I got a really good foundation. Uh, for plant diseases. Plus, I grew up on a on a farm in western North Carolina, um, just outside of Asheville in Haywood County. So this has been a part of my life for almost uh, 50 years. So it's kind of one of those things you don't always know what you don't know until you realize that really people need to know and you just knew what you knew. So here I am, <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, in a weird way. So what we're going to talk about tonight is plant diseases or what we call plant pathology in the university world. Uh, a lot of different things going on here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here other than to, to showcase that we're going to talk about non-living or abiotic and then living or biotic disease. So if you hear me use either of those terms, you know that that's kind of what they mean simultaneously with each other. Now, the other thing I want you to keep in mind uh, from an extension agent perspective, at least for me in Green County and a lot of my colleagues across the state, 
We have a lot of folks that bring in plant samples on that non-living abiotic side, thinking it's this side, which means in the long run, it's actually better, right? Because you're not going to have to use any type of chemical to be able to control that. So a lot of things that we're going to look at, we're going to look at some of those, what I call physiological stress responses from the plant. Because in lack of a better word, sometimes plants get pissed off and they kind of let you know, right? <laughs> Except for weeds. Weeds don't ever get on the Persian, right? Okay, so to kind of kick us off, when we talk about plant diseases, you need this, your triangle. You've probably seen this before. How many have seen it? Okay, we need all of those to be able to have a disease, right? So our ultimate goal is to be able to take away part of that disease triangle and it kind of disrupts that flow of diseases. And we're going to talk about a lot of different diseases tonight. So kind of remember the triangle, if we can take apart one side, Again, we're reducing the capacity for any kind of disease to become an issue. And I get ahead of myself sometimes. Y'all are going to figure that out tonight. I get to talking and I'll just go off on a tangent. Um, so why do we care about plant diseases? Obviously, that's going to inhibit the quality of food, right? Anytime we get disease, whether it's on the fruit itself or whether it's on the foliage, because anytime we get disease on the foliage, what does that do? It disrupts photosynthesis, right? And photosynthesis is how that plant makes food and pulls up nutrients and water to be able to produce that fruit in the long run. Um, we care because, especially from the organic realm, uh, we think about toxins. Sometimes even metal toxins can exist. Um, if you're purchasing property, you don't always know what has been grown on that property. So you may have residual carryover that you may not be aware of, especially if you're buying like a small farm. So that's something you need. Uh, to, to think about as well. Long-term plant diseases, not so much from yourself producing food for yourself, but at the grocery store, we see it all the time, right? Increase of food prices. So again, I'm going to start us out with what we refer to as abiotic plant problems. Again, remember, these are non-living things that are causing issues in our garden. And again, I would dare say from my perspective in Greene County, 75 to 80 percent of what I get is this right here. These next few things we're going to talk about. And I told Rosie, if I'd have known y'all were going to be a, an interactive group, I wouldn't have put what we're going to look at. I made y'all guess to start out with. But <laughs> anyway, I'm going to give you the answer first. Okay, we're going to go through a lot of pictures because I'm a very visual person and you don't know, have time to be like, well, it is man, there's nothing really in the field right now anyway. So I'm going to throw a lot of pictures your way of a lot of different crops. Okay, so sun stall. You might not think this is a major issue, right? But you can kind of see that sunken in area. So what's happening on the outside is happening on the inside of that fruit too. So you're going to lose some quality there, right? What do you think is causing sun stall? Overexposure. Overexposure to the sun. Why would that be? Oh. Huh? Loss of foliage. And oftentimes loss of foliage is going back to what? Disease issues, right? But sometimes it can just be other stress factors as well. But again, if we lose any of that shade canopy, that foliage, oftentimes it's going to expose that fruit, especially at ripening. And this is what we're going to get. It's going to look kind of yucky. Not just tomatoes, but on peppers. You can see what that looks like, that area of sunken uh, fruit and eggplant. And then this is what we call um, belly rot, so installed in cucumber. So it can affect a lot of different things. Again, anytime that we're altering the chemistry of that plant, disrupting the flow of nutrients, it's going to alter the flavor of that fruit as well. Okay, so that tomato is not going to quite taste as yummy or that cucumber when we have some of these kind of issues happen. Now we're going to get into more of this in a little bit more detail. But again, if you were to see this in your garden, would you tend to think that's disease? What I just showed you. A lot of people bring that in thinking it's some kind of fungal disease. All right, cap facing. This one, um, kind of unusual looking. Anybody had a tomato look like this from the gardens? Okay, what do you think causes that? A couple different things. Anybody want to think again? And how the watering, water can do that. Actually, uh, think about, well, sun's out now. Think about this weekend, how cool and cloudy it was. And if that happens right as tomato fruit starting to set flowers, that again disrupts those pathways in that plant, gives a switch. Also, if you don't have good pollinators in place, this can also be a sign of lack of pollination. 
How many of you have ever had a cucumber where it's look like the one I just showed you minus the belly rock, but the end kind of curves up and gets real slender and it's kind of bushy? You know what that is? That's like a pollination. So that means we need to build that pollinator base up a little bit. And you can use a lot of, I don't know if y'all have talked about this in other classes, but companion plants mm -hmm. using pollinator flowers, you know, mixing that within your garden. Uh, will help bring those beneficial pollinators in and kind of reduce some of this issue from occurring. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of some herbicide injury, and I know y'all are organic, but we're going to talk about how that can affect you even if you're not spraying here in just a minute. So do be aware that sometimes movement of off-target herbicides can also cause injury that's going to look very similar to that as well. Okay, so this is cracking. Um, how many of you have seen tomatoes yeah. look like this? Pretty crappy, right? You know what this is? Mm -hmm. Overwatering. Inconsistent. Who said that? Inconsistent watering. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's just physiological stress response. In a nutshell, what happens is that when that tomato or whatever is ripe, there's a there's a switch inside that plant that says, okay, I'm done growing. It's time for you to pick. So you know what I'm gonna call this right here? Lazy gardener syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> go out and pick that fruit when it's ready to be ripe. And what happens if we go into a weekend of this rain like we just had? It flips that switch back on. There's no room for that skin. That skin's already mm -hmm. set. So basically, what happens is it expands. And this is what causes that. Now, what is also going to happen here is that this can lead to a secondary infection. So, what's going to happen with some of these other things I'm going to talk to you in a minute, like bacteria or insects? and then pose another problem and we can have a disease that's going to come out of this. Now, it might not be too bad on this one tomato or this one tomato plant, but what you've done is say, hey, come on, bugs, come on. And then you just got a happy haven of bad bugs <laughs> in your garden. So just pick everything when it's right and you're good to go. I can alleviate a lot of these symptoms. Just show you a few of those. This is really prevalent on heirlooms. That's a phenomenon that you're, you're just not gonna get away from. Uh, but again, it's probably more critical than, than with the hybrid tomatoes on these heirlooms, get them picked pretty early. Because otherwise it can destroy your fruit if you have other disease, um, get in there. Uh, cracking is gonna affect a multitude of crops. So carrots, if you go to dig in the fall, um, make sure you're harvesting those timely as well. Somebody mentioned cold crops or brassicas a few minutes ago. So you might be seeing that right now as well. All right, so blossom end rock. I get a lot of folks that bring in samples with this. How many of you have seen this? Anybody have this in their garden? If you're growing in pots or raised beds, we tend to see that a little bit more prevalently than we do in ground because this is not necessarily lack of calcium, okay? It has to do with moisture fluctuations in the soil because when we look at how calcium moves within that soil profile, it's always moving. That plant needs water in order to move that calcium to make it available for that plant to take it up to the roots and move it through the rest of that plant. Okay, so it doesn't just mean that you're lacking calcium. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Let me show you a few more pictures here. So you can see just how to form all of our fruit looks. Okay, so. Have you had a soil science class? We haven't had a soil science class. Oh, it's my favorite thing to teach. You better hope she don't invite me back. Y'all are in trouble. <laughs> this, this, this is my love. We'll so. Okay. Um, well, you'll probably see this in August, but I'm going to harp on this right now. Get you a soil test no matter where you're at. Y'all have had soil Okay, good. It gives you that baseline. It's important. We harp on it. If you're an organic grower, your soil health is where it's at. Okay. Soil, the upper biochemical weather portion of the reglas, dirt is on the bottom of your shoes. Okay, you can't grow anything without health, healthy soil. Now, the reason that pH is so critical for veggie gardens, and we always say, I'm not my corner thing, I wonder if this thing works. Can't reach up there. You might be able to see it on. Um, we say six, I don't know, five, eight to six, eight, basically, for any of our vegetable garden. What happens if that soil pH gets too low and you're not putting a lime on there? Let's say you get a soil pH back of a 5.5. You're pretty close to being able to grow blueberries or communities or rhododendrons, but you're not really close to growing anything vegetable-wise, okay? So the reason we harp on lime 
It's because we're going to pull that pH up. If you don't pull that pH up and you're sitting right in here, look at calcium, what happens? It's not available. It's just basic chemistry. So it doesn't matter how beautiful that plant might be, if you don't have that soil pH right, it's going to interfere with a lot of these secondary nutrients. So a lot of times, um, and notice manganese, I see a lot of manganese toxicity brought in on plants because if that soil pH is too low, that means that mang manganese is just being up taken through those roots and maybe amounts and it actually becomes toxic to that plant. So that's why that soil pH is really critical and that's where calcium plays a big issue. That also ties back again to those moisture fluctuations. A lot of time you can't help mother nature, but always making sure that you're maintaining good moisture in your garden. That's helping make that calcium available. And the other reason I preach on that soil or the soil pH is we want to be sitting right here for a garden. Look what happens if we come down 5.5 to 5.2. Pretty big difference on those plant roots. So if you don't do anything else as a garden, make sure that soil pH is where it needs to be. That's one of the biggest things you can do to alleviate any, any kind of plant stress. Uh, when your hand, uh, plants are healthy and they have good vigor, they're not going to be as susceptible to disease pressure or to insect pressure. And there's lots blossom end run on watermelon. Anybody ever seen that before? Just be cautious, again, that you can see it on multiple plants. It's not just tomatoes. How about this one? Anybody harvest tomatoes and seen this before? That's what we call internal clock tissue. It's a really exciting name, right? <laughs> um, but basically what happens is this, you don't see this on the outside, first of all. So when you go to harvest your tomatoes, everything looks good. But then when you slice it open, you can those tomatoes are even fresh. But what happens is that flies, it's just pithy and hard, kind of like okra when you let it hang on, on the um, vines, you know, this looks really fibrous. So you basically have to cut all that out. You're losing a lot of material when you go to can those tomatoes, right? And then also, again, anytime we're disrupting that flow of nutrients, it's disrupting that flavor profile as well. So you can still, again, use this plant. It's just not as much. Not going to have as much there to use. Um, leaf curl. Yes. Did I miss uh, white internal white? Oh, that is, uh, is going to be caused by high temperatures early in the season. And oftentimes, um, any kind of water that you're pushing, Again, when we get heavy water, that's not just the end of Mother Nature. If you're pushing too much water, overwater can cause that. Um, think about heavy dews, heavy fogs. And when we get through um, into summer with those extended days of high humidity, we might not see rain ever, but some of that high humidity is going to cause a lot of these pathogens. Good question. Okay, so leaf pearl, uh, leaf roll, you're going to hear this called a lot of different things. Um, this would require one of those investigative sleuth things. Oftentimes, this could just be drought, uh, dry conditions. Um, I, I don't really see any spots there except right on the end. Uh, that could be some kind of herbicide injury. Actually, that could be overwatering. Lots of different things that can manifest itself right here. Um, also, depending on whether those leaves roll upward, inward, outward, downward. It's going to tell a pathologist something. So when you get this PowerPoint, just in essence of time, I'm not going to go through all of that. But issues like this, when it's brought in, we'll start asking you questions. Is it firing from the bottom? What's that leaf roll look like? Where is it at? And that kind of helps us pinpoint. Uh, but more often than not, that's something just physiological. Again, it's a stress response from that plant. Not always the case, but typically. Y'all do go back and read these PowerPoints, right? <laughs> Okay, um, herbicide injury. So nobody's using herbicides in here, right? Okay, but you got neighbors that might, right? You might have a neighbor that you can't see that might be using it. And I don't say this to scare you. I'm just pretty pragmatic and I'm to the point and I pretty well just say things. So I'm just shooting straight with you here. Um, you can have, like I say, a neighbor a couple miles that you don't even see that might be out one day spraying 2,4-D. You ever heard of it? Or any kind of phenoxy-based herbicide. What that means is if they're spraying on a high temperature day, typically we say the window is 68 to 86 degrees. If you spray on a high temp day, what happens is that material can volatilize and it moves off target for miles. The other thing, and what have we had a lot of here lately, wind. If somebody goes out and sprays on a windy day, 
that target can move or that product can move per mile. So you always don't know where it comes from? Not always, but to, uh, tomatoes, grapes, and then tobacco are very sensitive to a phenoxy-based herbicide. So those plants are gonna let you know, and you're gonna see some really weird symptoms and benefits. Um, now, people are these widely sprayed on turf, um, you know, in personal lawns, on golf courses, school grounds, um, farmers spray fence rows, a lot of different places that that material would come from. But look at how that plant kind of twists up. I don't know if you can see this very well, probably not, uh, but this stem gets really hard and it's almost like rubber. Like you go to break it and it just bends. Um, it gets really firm. You can kind of see how it twists up from the top of that plant. Anybody ever seen anything like that before? Okay, I hope y'all don't. Um, the other thing is that it can disrupt, bleh, disrupt flower production. Of course, if we don't have flowers, we don't have fruit. Um, if it's been sprayed, I probably don't want to be eating it anyway. Um, this is what we call a phyto effect. So sometimes it'll just bleach out those leaves. And again, if we don't have green leaf, we can't make food, right? And I just say this because one of the first things I told you when you come in, if you're buying property or maybe you're planting in an area that you don't know what was there before, um, you might have, you know, I don't know, purchased, well, I'll use tobacco. You know, I mean, I, there is no way that I would plant my garden in a, in a field that I ever had tobacco in because of chemicals I used on. Um, some of that herbicide has got some long lasting residual effects. So basically what happens, I go in a year from now and I plant cucumbers like this, and I see this weird phenomenon in front. What that is, is that residual from that soil and we're getting splash up, okay? So some of those uh, herbicides can linger in the soil. We've got some that live through the rumen of a cow, all right? And they poop it out, they eat hay that's been sprayed with it, they poop it out, they put a hay ring out in the field and get a big UFO circle, okay? So we get, we got some products out there that can cause a re residual effect. So always be sure that you know where you're planting uh, we've seen a lot of that again, just saying from, from tobacco. I hope you're not encountering I'm, one. Yes. Um, so how many years does that take? By, by well, they say for a certified organic, what is it? Is it three years now or is it seven? That um, you can have nothing in. I'm not sure. I want to say it's like. I think it's seven. seven. And then you've got like a transition zone from three to five to be able to move those yeah. chemicals out. But there's a lot of plants that can help mine some of that stuff out. If you're going large scale like that, so that's another class for me. <laughs> okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. And we're going to move into the, the fun stuff for tonight, right? But I want you to keep in mind all those pictures refer back to that PowerPoint. So if you see that kind of stuff happening, know that a lot of that stuff's not going to be um, in your control unless it's the lazy gardener. You know, you're not picking or harvesting timely, okay? So make sure that you're doing that. And that's really going to help re reduce some of these things we're going to look at next. And in the sense of time, I'm going to spare all the big scientific stuff about what all this is up here. But in a nutshell, some of the things that can affect um, what we call pathogens that can affect or bring disease into your gardens are nematodes, fungus, viruses, and bacteria. All right, so we're going to spend a little time on each one of those just to kind of get you acquainted. Now, notice there from that top line, fungus, noted multitudes. One of the reasons that they are so prevalent is because of what I already kind of said, when fungus is spore. So always remember mushroom. And we know how mushrooms reproduce, right? Or spores, okay? So that'll kind of help you remember. Um, but fungus need to have water, moisture to move. They need wind to help blow your spores and to get around and to infect. So a lot of those phenomena that I just saw you anytime there's an open wound on a plant, whether it's on the foliage or the fruit, like I was showing you, it's where some of these fungal pathogens can come in and take off. So that's what we want to prevent. All right, so let's start out with the fungi. Um, they're basically just a huge clump of nuclei, multicellular. Um, they've got these, what we call fruiting bodies. Um, this is what we never want you to see or encounter, but it's one of those things, Bolo, be on the lookout for. Uh, which leads me to a question. How many of you, see, I told you I'd get off tangent. How many of you keep a garden journal? It means sort of. I watch them. 
Yes. Um, if you don't take anything else from this class, do this. Your first and second year gardener, so I buy you a journal. Get our calendar for our 2024 calendar off the UT website. It's actually in the binders. Oh, it is. And you don't have to do that. Also, down. Okay. The reason I say this note the date, uh, note what you've got going on, take us a, a picture, put that in your journal. Keep a record of all this stuff. Whether it's diseases, insects, when you're seeding your plant, when you um, the last frost made the herb, I mean, keep everything jotted down because come December and January, look back to that, and that's going to help you plan for next year. Because I promise you, when you get one of these, you ain't going to annihilate it in one season. We need seven years in a seed bank, typically, is what we say. <laughs> we fungal pathogens, and we're going to talk about how to alleviate some of that in a minute. I'm going to go on my soapbox. I'm going to stand out of there. I'm going to preach here in just a few minutes. But write it down because you know what I've discovered as I've gotten older? I don't remember crap anymore. You know that CRS phenomenon? Mm -hmm. So then even like a week, week to week, I'm just like now, listen, what, when did it rain? How much rain? How many days is that? Oh, yeah. That could be the reason I'm seeing this. So just jot it down, right? Mm -hmm. All right, the reason I say this, if you start seeing this weird black stuff on the soil, hopefully nobody ever sees that. Southern black, that's what we're looking at. That's what we call a uh, hyphae, the way it streams out in the mycelium. My mycelium grows on the stem. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a few minutes. Anybody ever seen these little fruit bodies? Y'all are going to really like my analogy here. That's what we call sclerotia bodies. Those are fungal bodies. That's where those spores are at. I say it looks like rat food. People call the office sometimes and they'll be like, I've got this, da 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 da. And I'll be like, you go out and look and tell me if you see anything that looks like rat food on that stem, where that leaf connects to the stem. And they're like, uh, come here. And I'm like, no, just press me. And then I have to explain it to them. But if you see little black bodies, that's going to tell us that that's a fungal pathogen. And then these are things we look at under the microscope just to be able to differentiate. Now, again, these are things. You may encounter. We're going to hit on several of these right now. I'm going to take you in depth on things that I see here in East Tennessee. Now, again, I've already kind of talked about this with fungal infection. You need that little thermal water to get it going. All right, you need wind, uh, fungal, again, sporulating, and they're going everywhere. Okay. All right, so here we go. We're going to get into the meat of it. How many of you have heard these two words? Pythium or Phytophthora. I hope you never have to learn these words, y'all. But I want to show you some pictures just so you'll kind of, again, know what to be looking for. So right now is the time that we're going to be taking transplants to the garden, or maybe you're going to plant seedlings in the garden. Um, Mother Nature's kind of quirky this time of year. We're, we're seeing that right now. Um, so you might plant a really wet soil. Like if we were to go out and plant right now after this weekend. Uh, maybe we start some little seedlings in our window and we take them outside and we put this phenomenon. See so you how know that skin is kind of pinched up there? It gets real soft. But what is that? That's disrupting the flow of nutrients, right? And the transport of water. This is what, in a nutshell, we call damping off. If you purchase plants somewhere, how many of you take that plant out of its pot when you're at Lowe's or Evergreen? They love it when I come to Evergreen. <laughs> I mean, you can take them out of the pots. I got one back here. Kudos for you. Take it out because a lot of this is going to manifest itself below that soil line. Okay. Pull that uh, tomato plant out. Do this with everything but cucurbits. Cucurbits don't like their roots to serve. But take that plant out of that pot. Investigate those roots. If you see any kind of brown sliminess or if you just see strings, I'm, I'm going to show you pictures of that. Um, you don't want to buy that plant because what you're doing is taking disease home with you. Okay, so always investigate what you're taking home. Um, oftentimes, pythium, this is what we're looking at here. Um, we call that a secondary infection because oftentimes that plant is stressed. And again, that's how those fungal pathogens enter that plant. This is what we don't want to see. All right, so even if you're sloughing off a little bit of that soil, maybe you just kind of keep it where you can put it back in the pot to either take it home or leave it on. But this is what you don't want to see, brown bushy roots. You want a good root ball, right? You want to see that pot clump of white roots. You want to see white roots. 
And again, uh, you may see some scarred lesions, all right? We don't have an active infection here or here. This is healing, but is that plant really going to make it? Again, we've disrupted the life of the flow, so no. This is actually an active infection. So anytime you see that sliminess right at the soil line again, we don't want to be taking that home with us. Rhizop and pythium go hand in hand. That's why I'm showing you this picture again. So sometimes it's real critical to call your agent, call somebody that knows those differences. Oftentimes though, we lump those together and you're gonna see me do that with a lot of fungal pathogens because no matter if you're organic or conventional, I'm gonna tell you to treat them the same, okay? Sometimes if you're going on a large scale, that's why we need to know the differences. But again, Rhizoc, you wanna be looking for that um, soupy stem. It's gonna get really weak. Um, again, this is a scar. You don't want to be planting that because, again, we've disrupted that flow of that vascular tissue. Lettuces right now are probably coming on, so you can actually see a lot of this. Now, one of the best ways to prevent some of this issue is airflow. We don't want to be planting too close. You know how you see, even we hand out all these publications and we get into this plant space. Okay, we're going to get the things to eat. And I need to make sure that I'm, and then I got to measure the finger rays. Then I need to get the food. You know, those numbers are important. Pay attention to that because that's airflow and that's really going to help produce this pathogen. Yes, you got a question? Yeah, which I think are these? Do they still fungus? This is all fungus. Yep. I'll let you know when we switch. And again, just some pictures there. Again, cucumbers, it's going to manifest itself on the fruit as well. And again, that's a secondary infection, so maybe stress. And I want to show you why cucumbers might be stressed, and you might see this in a few minutes. Can you eat that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, usually on uh, the cucumbers, it's going to be kind of similar to that tomato. So you probably have to just cut out a little bit, but it'll be right on the inside of that skin. You really, really can. But again, it's going to alter that flavor. So even burpless or uh, cucumbers that are not as bitter, Sometimes they can alter that chemistry and we'll get better taste. Good question. Um, this is actually a poinsettia, but again, I like the scar that it's formed. Um, it's gonna stunt that plant. So you might get a little growth, but it's still not gonna take off and grow like your other plants would. All right, this is alternaria. This is one uh, we lump together. I, I call things by that scientific name um, just because that's kind of what I've been trained to do. But in layman's term, when you see alternaria, probably what you're going to most associate that with is early blight of tomatoes. But know that alternaria is going to be one of those fungal pathogens that can affect a lot of other crops in our gardens as well. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few pictures of that. Anybody ever seen this in their cabbage? Um, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, instead of a black head, it'll be black and yellow. You're going to get those spots kind of together there. Um, one of the biggest ways to prevent this is going to be resistant cultivars. And I'm going to harp on that a little bit later, but alternaria can be prevented just by my certified disease-free seeds, plants. Don't go to the grocery store and buy potatoes or take them wrinkled up potatoes that you had stowed and you forgot they're there and they're sprouted and think I'm going to go find them in the garden. You can do that and you'll get potatoes, but they're not certified disease free. So what you're doing is introducing introducing possible pathogens. Uh, plus, if you're not buying organic, you don't know what's been sprayed on these potatoes anyway. So alternate area, we want to be looking for what I call target spot appearance. Not all spots, dots are the same. Okay. Um, same time we've got these concentric rings. Kind of looks like a bullseye. Yes. So at this moment, so you think if you have vegetables, you're going to um, turn it into compost. Can you do that with non organic and that's not bringing it out of your compost properly? If you're heating that properly, it's going to kill most of your pathogen. Um, so that literally did what you said. I was not too much out there, but you thought I said that, and I've seen it about that. Yeah, you're not going to get a lot of residual from that. You're going to have that compost hopefully heating up so much and you're turning it that it's not going to be an issue. But some people are pretty strict on, on being 100% organic. So that's going to be a personal philosophical decision. You also want to make sure that your compost is being up to the 
But continue that thought. If you don't do it, yeah, then yeah. A few it anyway. will likely not get yeah. to the heat that you need and therefore may not kill. So you just want to make sure that you are basically composting needs to be a pain to be doing it right. Mm -hmm. Truly. Truly. Like yeah. it's 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 a lot of work. Um if it's not a pain, you may have like uh, it might not be getting up to when it's easy to off. And then you're just gonna pass that on when you use it again, you're just gonna spread it all over your garden. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that when you're doing And when you brush it, I mean I, I have compost at home. I also have it to do it on all my master garden projects. But there's going to be some things that I'm not going to put on that pile, even though I'm doing it right. Um, I'm going to throw it on a burn pile and I get rid of it. I like to burn. It's a good thing because I burn a lot. <laughs> I think yeah. if you have the bees plants in your garden, I would not put that on the yeah. virus. Yeah. Absolutely. True. Yeah. So when you see leaves like that, is the, is the disease systemic to the whole plant? So there's no okay. pulling off the leaves is not going to Right. Very good question. So, anyway, when we see all the area, and I'll probably discuss it again for the end, about I was showing you pictures right now to show you everything. Um, we'll, we'll say, we'll ask you questions, you know, if that plant is firing from the bottom, and we start to see these spots from the bottom and start moving, mm -hmm. kind of like when you clean up tape, it's the same thing. So, it is moving throughout that plant. Um, this is one that there's no curative fix for, period. I don't care if you're spraying. The biggest commercial fungicide. It's not anything that's going to, if there's no cure to fix. This is where we want to be prevented. Okay. And a lot of normal pathogens, that's the key. Do you know what the biggest thing to reduce in this issue right here is? It's something so simple. It's not overhead watering. How many of you are going out there with a water hose and wetting that foliage down, or you got a sprinkler up in your garden or your raised bed? Don't do that. Because that's just promoting an environment for these pathogens. But this is a you know one of the things that's really easy to prevent just through cultural management. Yes. So like this is in the plant, and if you're if you're having to take the plant out, you throw the plant away, or you burn. Like is that in your soil now? No, well, no, not not technically. There can be fungal pathogens that linger. You can have some residual. Uh, some are in the soil, some are not. That's why identification is going to be critical. So you could have other pathogens, fungal pathogens, that are going to manifest similarly. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, but yeah, get rid of that that mm -hmm. plant. You can keep trimming those leaves off, but eventually you're not going to have enough to make a food for that plant. Yes. So, so the alternate areas are not taking it. Right. Um, so again, just look at that appearance, that shot hole appearance. This is the this is the key giveaway right here. Concentric rings, um, you got that bullseye, that little thingy right there is what we call a stigmidia. That's what re is releasing those spores again. Um, another way that if you call your extension agent, that they're gonna be able to tell that this is all the area, we're gonna ask you where those spots are at. If it's on the stem. Typically, that's going to be alternary as well. That's going to manifest itself in all the places of that plant. This is one that you want to be on the lookout for early. Uh, it's not called early blight because it's early. We can see early blight late season. Late blight can come early. Okay, It doesn't mean that we don't see late blight for August. So keep that in mind. They're going to showcase a little bit different symptom. Uh, but the, the big key takeaway is to be preventative. And we're going to spend a little bit more time on that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the reason that this is so bad again is because you get all this coalescing of the of these spots. And this is eventually what you get. And again, no place for that plant to make food. So I'm showing you a lot of pictures because I really want you to get familiar with those spots. This is one that we see a lot of. Um, mildew, how many of you are growing cucurbits, vine crops, cucumber, squash, okay, watermelons? Even lupus would fall in this category. Um, the mildews. This is powdery mildew. Kind of looks like you spread talcum powder or flour over the surface of that leaf. Um, some people, if they're using seven dust, would say, well, that kind of looks like seven dust, but this is actually powdery mildew. Now, oftentimes we're going to see these together. 
just like we see alternaria and septoria, which we're going to talk about next. We often see those together. We're going to treat them the same. Um, powdery, the biggest difference, you're going to have black powder on the top of that leaf surface. Downy mildew, you're going to see those yellow spots on the top. But if you look on the underside, it's where you're going to see the spores. We're just flip flopping the two. Oftentimes, you're going to have them together, though. Um, if you see those pretty little yellow pokey dots with the white, typically that's going to be downy mildew. But again, we're going to treat them the same way. So see how that powder is more on the underside on your down. And then uh, if it gets to be a bad infection and that, that goes systemic, then you're going to see spots that look like that. And again, I don't know if you can kind of see this. See all that little white along the those uh, lesions, that again is mycelia. That's that reproduction body. So that's where those spores are laying. Um, that's a really tiny leaf, but there's just thousands of those little spores just clustered on one little spot. So that's why it's really important to get a hold of that. If you grow basil or hops, that's another one that can get downy mildew really bad. So this one's septoria, and I probably should have put this one with alternaria. Uh, because we're typically going to see early blight and septoria together. Uh, the biggest difference here is just the little white brown spot. You don't have that yellow uh, halo effect. You don't have that bullseye pattern and those little rings. So that's how you can tell the difference. If I had to say, I would rather have septoria, the plain old boring spots, versus the early blight. Um, from a vantage point of stunting the plant, septoria typically won't hinder full production of that plant like your early blight will. Now, when we talk about early blight, we're going to talk about some chemicals here in a few minutes, but you're going to be rotating chemicals just like you rotate crops. And you know why we do that, even with organic chemicals? Build up of resistance, right? Because each one of these chemicals are going to have a different mode of action and how they terminate the problem. Okay, so just kind of keep that in, in mind. So when you go to spray in these preventative controls, which is now, as soon as you get tomatoes in the ground, and especially if Mother Nature keeps playing these neat little tricks on us, um, we're going to probably see an early occurrence. And that's the one thing with black. I see it earlier and earlier every year. And I use the analogy, you know what a June beetle is? Well, we used to see those in June, in July. When do we see June beetles now? We see them now. So there's also a little bug called a May beetle. It's a little bit smaller than the June beetle. They used to come in May, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Well, those have been out a while. So we're starting to see some of those um, shifts from like climate. Um, those things are really affecting agriculture in a lot of different ways, okay? So that's just one of the ways that we're seeing earlier of some of these diseases. Uh, another example, we used to say, if you're going to treat for drugs in your lawn, you do it when the forsooth is in blood. We can't do those type of things anymore because, you know, we're already past that window to get that crabgrass for going on. It's already sprouted. It's already germinated. So some of those weather type things that we used to use, we can't do anymore. It's the same thing with disease progression. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, as soon as you get tomatoes out, you probably want to start those preventative controls. Now, like I say, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But again, that's just a little bit of the difference between the alternaria and the uh, septoria. And again, you're going to see both of those together. They're both going to sporulate um, the same way. All right, here's one uh, you'll probably see a lot of, anthracnose. I know this is on a red pepper, so I apologize. You probably can't see this, but I'll have better pictures. Can you see this like floral, salmon-colored fuzzy powder looking stuff. Anytime you see that color, almost a reddish purple salmon color, that's going to tell us that's in fragments. Okay, so basically what you're going to get is that rotten soft spot. Um, you're going to see this during periods of high humidity. This is one we're going to see throughout the summer months pretty prevalently. Again, you're going to see it on all kinds of different food crops. Um, this is one that we see later in the season. Our winter squashes and our pumpkins, you don't always see that on because it's really hard to see it, right? So that's why you got to be uh, scouting and getting those preventative controls on pretty early. 
Yeah, so anywhere that you see those dark sunken lesions, I was trying to see, yeah, you can see the salmon color. Can you see that right in here? So that's going to be the dead giveaway on that. Now that's an advanced case. Pretty gross. I wouldn't eat no part of that tomato. <laughs> and I'm pretty thrifty and I'm frugal and I like to save and salvage everything, but yeah, I am eating that. And there's a really good picture of what that's going to look like on, on a stem of the plant. And again, just to show you that color. Somebody say something. No. Okay, so Botrytis. This is what I commonly refer to as gray mold. Um, I see this a lot in fruit crops. So some of you may be growing strawberries and of course those are ripening right now. So if you're seeing any of this, that's gonna be gray mold. And all that is is just a big berry full of spores that's dying to get out really thick <laughs> else nearby. So um, that is gonna deteriorate that fruit like you can see there. Um, in the summertime, again, when we get in those periods of high humidity, um, heavy dews, uh, we can see it manifest itself on grapes. Um, yeah, I'm not making wine from that, are y'all? <laughs> um, but we're gonna see that even in onion crops, root crops that we might not be able to necessarily see above ground, but there can be some issues going on below ground. And again, uh, anthracnose, it's still fungal in nature because this is the one fungal type, which is what we see the most of. But again, anytime you see this weird white mycelium, high fever looking stuff, that's going to be those fruiting bodies. That's how it's sporulating. You want that out of it. You want to remove that as quickly as you can. So again, damp weather is not going to be your friend on a lot of these. So how do we manage it? Uh, the biggest thing, resistant plants. Make sure again, certified clean seed and stock, clean and equipment. How many of you do that? I don't know if I'm doing it right. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. You should say a nine to one mixture of Clorox bleach. Uh, some people may use vinegar. I like the bleach because I've, I, when you're around these packages all the time, you take every extra step because, yeah, you know, so I'm funny about that. Uh, when I say equipment, I mean your homes, your prowls, if you got a tiller, whatever you're doing, sanitizing it regularly, and especially at the end of the season before you store it. Um, proper drainage and aeration. It goes back to soil science. Um, how many of you done a perk test in your garden area before you planted? Dig a hole. There's a, there's a song called Dig a Hole. Dig a Hole. And move. Okay. <laughs> um, I sing that song to my master gardeners when we're out. Perkin. We just got a new project with Eddie Crockett for a place that park. And we have two different tracks that we're doing. It's like, well, let's perk it. Let's what? Let's perk it. What does that mean? Let's dig a hole. Let's fill it full of water and let's see what happens. And they're like, okay. So we had one hole that just kind of stayed full of water for like two days. Do I want to plant anything right now? I don't have good drainage. I need to increase that soil till. See, I'm getting off on my soil science. But make sure that you've got good drainage. When you do that soil test, if you don't have good organic matter, if you've got 100% red clay, now I love red clay. If you ever do my soil science class, you'll understand why. Clay holds a negative charge. A lot of our nutrients are positive charges. So they're going to stick into that soil profile longer and be available for nutrient uptake. So that's why I like clay. Don't batch it too bad. But when you have 100% clay, you don't have any oomph or any fluff in that soil, right? So um, adding some of that fluff is going to be really good before you start planting. Plus, if you get a soil that cracks, like after this rain and the sun comes on and you see that sun cracking, that's typically a heavy or a clay soil. And seeds will germinate in that. So that means you need to start adding organic matter. But that's going to be one of the best things again. If you're an organic gardener, making sure the soil is right is going to be your number one, number one thing you need to do. And you can't fix a soil pH once. And call it done because soil will revert to its native pH. So if you start out with a 5.8, you're going to be lining that soil probably ever fall. Okay, so keep that in mind. But soil health is where it's at. Aeration that not only means um, air flow through the plants and get proper spacing, that also means aeration in the soil. Y'all know what I'm talking about there? When we got that heavy clay soil, what do we want in there? We want earthworms. And all kinds of microbes burrowing through there. You know, and grub worms are not that bad. They do turn into Japanese beetles. But I try not to be too 
fussy. I started to use another word. I try not to be too fussy because they are making a uh, channel through that soil. So what they're doing is aerating that soil. But the more earthworms you can get, I've got 10 minutes. Oh my Lord, seriously? Okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, We're gonna move on. We've not even got to virus. Okay, viruses are not a living organism. That's what you need uh, to remember. Viruses are my favorite. Okay, of all the diseases, because you get these really weird looking things. So if you ever see something weird going on, and you're, I mean, like, isn't that cool? On the foliage or on the green, you know, I get excited when I see a virus. This is, you know, I am like, this right here. Anybody who's seen tomatoes like this? That's tomato spotted wilt virus. Okay, virus number one, it's like this when we get cold. You're going to take an antibiotic for that. You're going to take a few things to alleviate your symptoms, but you're not going through it. That same thing. Tomato spotted wilt virus, and I guess Adam's going to touch on this next month. Mm -hmm. This is vectored by a thrip, an insect. So if you want to spray something organic to control a disease, there's like money out of my pocket, but you can't do that. You got to use an insecticide, okay, to be able to control that. But what are you going to do? You know how funny thrips are? You can't get a good control on those, right? Because they're outside. So one of the biggest things you can do is increase that beneficial population, companion planting. Utilizing cover crops through the season. I swear, Rosie, I could go on for days. <laughs> I really could. I'm going to skip through maybe spotted wilt. It's blown up. He's really teeny tiny, so you can't always see him, but that's going to vector this. Uh, when you're buying tomato plants right now, anywhere, look for them little speckles. Okay? Look for that feeding damage. Don't buy those plants and take home because you're probably taking thrips home with you. Okay, um, there it is on peppers. See those really cool looking spots? That's why I just love viruses. Okay, viruses, again, no chemical control. Resistant cultivars are gonna be huge here. So make sure you always know what you're buying. Um, sanitation, I'm gonna harp on this real quick. Maintain and clean your garden throughout the season. Okay, you're gonna put a lot of stuff in that garden, right? Uh, maybe pie pans for the birds, you're gonna have stakes for trellis support, you're gonna have cages on your tomatoes, the list goes on and on. Uh, you're gonna have plants that die. Pull that out, compost it, throw them on the burn pile, keep it clean. What you're doing anytime with any of these diseases, virus, fungi, <laughs> whatever, you're just inviting those or those pathogens to overwind. Okay, it's like the you know old old lady with all the cats, you know, the thousand cats. You know, there's a sign up at the end of the drive. Lady will feed you for free. It's the same thing with fungal pathogens. When they find a happy place to rest and they've got a good environment, they're sticking around. So sanitation is gonna be key. Bacteria, uh, you're gonna have to have a film of water. Now remember, for humans, we take an antibiotic. Same thing with plants. So there's some things out there, streptomycin, uh, copper, some of those things that are gonna enhance the immune system of that plant. Um, and help not cure these, but help reduce the prevalence. Uh, one way that you can tell if it's a bacteria, take a stem, chuck it down in water, pull it out. If it strains, really grows, stringy like salt, that's going to be a bacteria. That's one way you can tell it. Again, um, this is a leaf hopper. It's going to be a vector of wilt diseases and, and trees. Uh, bacterial wilt. This is the one I hate. This is what I have at my house. It's spread by cucumber beetles, spotted and striped. So, so if you ever had this, again, write that down in your journal because you're going to have to start working on something to control the cucumber beetles for next year. Anything that's a beetle is going to burrow down and make a grub worm or a grub of some sort. They're just going to look different, so remember that. Uh, nothing we can do for this. You can see the critters right there. Basically, overnight, it's going to scald those plants. There's your spotted cucumber. Look for egg casings on the underside of the leaf. So when you're scouting, look under. If you're growing cucumbers, anything that's on a vine, grow it up. Get you a vertical support. You can see it a little bit better, plus you're keeping that root off the ground. All right, scab. Um, this one is going to be bacterial in nature. The biggest thing to prevent that is not planting potatoes when the soil is wet. Um, make sure it's completely dry. Um, if you plant potatoes, don't ever plant directly in peat or any kind of organic matter, because that's where this comes from. And, oh, you're smiling. Uh-oh, we got her. We busted her. 
No. Uh oh. 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 I say I can tell. Okay. Um. This is still edible. It's just ugly. All right. You can still eat it. Typically, sometimes if it's a bad enough infection, it will penetrate the skin, but not always. Okay. So still edible. All right. Soft rot. I don't even know what that is. That's a cabbage. Yeah. Um. Pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty gross looking. You get that sunken in appearance. A lot of people are going to think it's a fungal pathogen, uh, but oftentimes you're going to get uh, copper is going to be one of the one of your friends as an organic garden. Um, okay, that's one you really want to get familiar with. Um, again, all of this is the same, but um, crop rotation. That's where that's going to come into play. You don't rotate tomatoes where your potatoes were last year. You don't put eggplant where your peppers were last year because why? They're all members of the solanaceous family. So know your families because there's a lot of weeds or flowers that are going to be in same, the same family as some of the crops that were growing in the garden. So make sure you're rotating those too. I've read that on small garner, backyard gardeners, that's not as important. Is that not true then? What? The crop rotation. No, it's it is. I think it's very important. If you get into some of these pathogens, especially, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you need to be rotating. Plus, you get that symbiotic relationship. Like corn is a grass, technically. It's a heavy feeder. It's going to use a lot of nitrogen. Plants your beans there next year. Legume, taking nitrogen and fixing it back in the soil. Okay. So, this is where we're at. All of y'all are at, right? <laughs> right now. <laughs> I've already seen these expressions, right? Okay, so what next? Pest ID is critical. We'll move through these pretty quick. Um, again, one of the biggest things that I will tell you, um, the earlier, typically, you can plant your garden, the better off you're going to be. Let's go back to cucumber meals. I know you're not going to believe this, but this is true. Plant your cucurbits from seed, if you can. The cucurbit roots don't like to be disturbed. Um, so you don't always get livable, but the caveat to that is that cucumber beetles can smell cucumber seeds germinating, mm -hmm. and that invites them in. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's kind of one of those weird phenomena. Um, again, journal, keep a book of anything that you're seeing, watering. If you're, you know, as an organic gardener, invest in drip tape. Don't do that over watering thing. Um, Wildlife injury, some of y'all were talking about that earlier. I didn't show you any pictures of that. Sometimes that can be an issue. Again, think about that soil test, fertility issues, because not only are some of those diseases abiotic that we looked at first, we're going to have a lot of nutritional deficiencies that we need to maybe rectify too if that soil pH ain't right. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but when we're looking for clues, again, any kind of fruiting structure or body that you see, that's going to tell us it's fungal in nature, and we may be past that window. So again, that's why preventative is the key. Um, anytime you see ooze like this, again, it's that film of water. So if you see something like that, that's going to be bacterial. That's where copper comes in. Prevention is the best line of defense. Fungal pathogens, you can kind of see how they spread. They start at the bottom, and they kind of work up. Virus, again, uh, is going to enter through any kind of opening in that plant. So again, if you've got an insect, a piercing insect, think stink bug, mm -hmm. it's opening that little teeny tiny hole and that's where some of these viruses and bacteria um, can enter. Okay, we're moving really fast, I promise. And um, let me see what I wanna talk about here. Okay, cultural control of in season roguing. You know what that means? You've already talked about it a little bit. We're going to pull that disease plant out. You get bacterial wheel from those cucumbers, you yank them out. They ain't going to live. They're not going to produce nothing. Get rid of them, throw them on the burn pile. If you get a heavy infestation or downy or powder you're going to do and you can't get it under control, get it out. Same thing with early bot. And I, I know I sound like I'm being ugly, but I'm just I'm just saying don't let it don't let it linger. It manifests itself into a bigger problem later. Maybe not this year, but maybe the next. But get those plants out of there. That's what we call roguing plants. We're destroying that entire plant, not just pieces of it, the entire plant, roots and all. Um, prune. Uh, again, pruning is going to help with airflow, right? Uh, the more you prune, the bigger the fruit you're going to have, like on tomatoes. Okay. If you don't prune, you're going to have smaller tomatoes and a lot more of them. 
So pruning is going to do a lot of different things for you, but uh, just making sure that you're keeping a lot of good airflow is going to be very um, beneficial. Remove everything out of that garden. Uh, treat everything with that 9 to 1 Clorox solution. Let it dry. Store it for the winter time. <laughs> Alternate host removal. We kind of talked about that a minute ago with plant families. Know your plant families. Be able to rotate through those. Um, avoidance. Again, this is going to go back to that crop spacing. Pay attention. <laughs> uh, mulching. I didn't talk about this. Um, make sure you're using some kind of mulch in some form or fashion. Straw is really good because what you're doing is any of those soil warm pathogens, we're keeping it from grain splashing on that soil and splashing up onto the fruit or into the stem or the lower leaves of that plant. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you're not using a mulch like that, use a living mulch, buckwheat, clover, cowpeas, something like that that you can pop along, plant it in between your rows in your garden. Um, that's a good pollinator source. Plus, you're reducing weed seed populations. Plus, you're kind of helping bring in the beneficial um, bugs into that habitat. Um, always water when those plants are still a little bit wet in the morning because you're basically washing off the rotation and the dew from the previous night. Don't water late in the day like at this time because you're going to just leave that lingering and that's where disease pathogens are going to form. So, oh, I didn't show you that. Whoops. So that's where we want to be watering early in the morning before noon. Um, resistant cultivars, I can't speak to that enough. If you're wanting to grow heirlooms, that's why that journaling is going to be really critical. Pay attention to what you're having issues with. I don't care if it's disease, insect, whatever. That way you know how to better deal with that because your heirloom tomatoes, your beans are going to have a little bit more disease and some pressure. Um, but this is a difference. Non-resistant cultivar versus resistant. Okay, so hybrids are not always bad except in tomatoes. So remember that. Explore beneficials. If you see this phenomenon occurring, that's a good thing. Um, it's a wasp, raffinid wasp that's sucking the insides out of that caterpillar. I like it when that happens. Uh, real uh, quick, whether you have organic uh, or conventional, I, I share this with all my classes, know your difference between protecting and penetrant, protecting is where you want to be um, because you're preventing that disease from occurring. You want to be proactive rather than, than reactive. Uh, penetrant's going to be a little bit more costly. It's going to linger. We're going to get into a little bit more residual activity. The thing organic gardeners kind of struggle with sometimes is the repetition. It's not a one and done. You're doing it all the time. So be aware of that. If you're like me, I'm gone all summer. And so I leave and everything's beautiful. When I come home, I'm like, well, I'm done. Because, you know, seven or 10 days out can really make a difference in a garden, especially if you're if you're organic. So just keep that in mind. Get somebody to uh, take care of your garden while they're feeding your cat at the same time. Um, again, I've already kind of talked about this. Sanitation is key. Um, sanit sanitize through the season. Um, and yeah, I'm going to close out here. Um, I can teach y'all this one slide for three hours and I'll spare y'all. This is my favorite topic in the universe. It goes back to soil science. Um, if you're not familiar with cover crops, get familiar because it is a number one tool in the organic gardener's toolbox. Okay, it goes right in alignment with basic soil science, okay, and that soil pH. This can help more than you'll ever know. Look at all the things cover crops do. So, um, where is it? Let's see, right here. That's me. I don't see a lot of name codes here, but these others can really help with that. For instance, I'm not going to shut up. Um, rye grass planted in the fall, let it grow through the winter time. It's big, it's bulky. You got to turn it under this time, you know, February, this time of year. So it can be bulky. But it has an allelopathic effect. Anybody know what that means? Allelopathic means that it's going to, it's a symbiotic relationship, basically. It's going to help suppress weed seed germination. So when you weed eat that, this time of year and then turn it under, it's going to have a lingering effect, just like some of those chemicals have a residual ryegrass is going to have that same kind of carryover. So we can, uh, some of these cover crops can support some of those weed seeds. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Really explore those all. Okay, I went way too long, but I love to talk about certain things and I could just go all day. So where do we find you if we want to hear you go on all day? Um, I, I do teach a lot of classes and I actually teach a lot of Zoom classes. But, um, 
online. I just finished my Monday musings. Um, I call them that because that started during COVID. So I usually do four different topics. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, Rosie, but I do an Appalachian heritage and culture class. So we, we do folklore and tie it back to the language of the plants here in the Southern Appalachian. Um, I do basic gardening classes on there. I do fruit series. I do herbs. Um, I'm big into the best medicinal and edible herbs. I've actually got plots out of the research station in Greenville. Um, every plant has to have a, a use. We talk about what that is and tie it back to the culture of the area. So where do we find where those are? Uh, um, where has got from? my information. Okay. So, if you have any upcoming classes you want to send my way, I can also send them out. Okay. Pictures. And I usually opt. It's a little different. I go from October typically till April. I, I tend to not take the summer off, but be available for this type of stuff. I have a lot of um, this kind of stuff coming in all the time. Um, but I'm easy to find. I have an Ask Us portal on my website through the Master Gardeners. I will send her all this. How about I send you yeah, an email tomorrow with everything? Great. Or if anybody's here and wants my doc card, you can scan it. You can find me on Facebook here right now in the class. Anybody got questions? And I will so that let y'all go. Handouts too. Oh, handouts. Oh, my Lord. Oh, yes. Pass those out. And real quick. And then I'm shutting up. Anybody got this yet? This is my Bible. Okay, the thing you're going to notice, look here at the top, it says conventional and organic product overview. That was what was in the next few slides. Right? Mm -hmm. Anything that's mm -hmm. highlighted in this pale yellow green, that's for free. It's organic. It's worth the chemicals. So, the notion, uh, what was the other one you said? Serenade, Sorgo, all of those are in here. So, if you get any of these diseases I was talking about, let's go find them. A list of organic chemicals to be able to utilize. If you have questions on those, can you call around me? Oh, is everybody here in Washington County? No. Anybody else? Washington Green, Unicoi, Sullivan. Okay, well, y'all just call it. Where? Johnson. Johnson. Oh, well, I thought I was going to from Johnson County. So, yeah, just. Put me up or look me up. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I should turn that off.